Good morning. Uh, welcome to the Graduate School Celebration of Coeducation. We'd like to welcome you all here this morning on behalf not only of the Association of Princeton Graduate Alumni, but the Committee to Celebrate Undergraduate Coeducation and the Celebration of Coeducation generally has also very generously co-sponsored this program today. Um, what we have done today in our celebration and retrospective is invite some women who have been here throughout the span of Princeton's Coeducational Graduate School to speak to you. Um, and we're going to go, we're going to start with the very first woman who came to Princeton and our last speaker will be someone who is a current graduate student. But before I let you hear from them, I'd like to set the stage a little. And I think I could start by introducing myself. Might help. Um, I'm Lisa Drakeman. I finished my PhD in the Religion Department in 1988. I'm currently a lecturer there, and I'm the coordinator of this program today and this evening. Um, I've specialized in the history of American religion, particularly the history of women and religion. And as a historian, I really can't let you come and join us today without giving you a little historical background on the history of women and higher education. Um, women's higher education began in the United States really in 1837 at Mount Holyoke College. Mount Holyoke was founded by a woman named Mary Lyon who thought that women of very modest means had every right to higher education. Now, considering the financial circumstances of the time, for example, in 1837, there was a major depression in this country, it wasn't easy to provide educational opportunities for women. Mary Lyon devised a plan. She, she um, gathered an endowment, built a large building in which all the activities of the school could take place, and then, just, and then worked out a way that women could come to college for a very reasonable cost. All they had to do was get up at 4 o'clock in the morning, do all the laundry, do all the cooking, do all the baking, clean the building, and do their schoolwork, and they could usually get to bed somewhere around 10 o'clock that night. Unfortunately, once in a while, the plan would go awry, but that was okay. They simply set the hours of the clock back so that there was enough time left in the day before bedtime to finish the work. So this was the beginning of women's higher education. Because there wasn't much money and because there wasn't a lot of support for it, women worked very, very hard for their education. Now, I have to say, even though this pattern wasn't followed by the men's colleges of the time, that Princeton thought that maybe they would like to be part of this movement. So they had a savings offering for the cost-conscious student. You could save $6 a year if you were a Princeton student if you dispensed with all private servants in your room. Okay. Um, now, there were no servants, private or otherwise, at Mount Holyoke or any of the early women's schools. Um, but there were other obstacles in addition to all the hard work and the lack of money that the women faced when they decided to get their education. And that obstacle really was prejudice against women as scholars, prejudice against the idea that women should have higher degrees and, and learning. Let me give you a wonderful and probably my husband's favorite example of this. Uh, Matthew Vassar opened a women's college in 1865. A New York Post reporter defended the idea on the whole, but he noted how much ignorance is required in a woman to induce and sustain proper female delicacy is a question that has never been answered. Okay. These were the supporters, remember. Okay. Well, with college barriers down by the late part of the 19th century, women went on to graduate education. This was really not initially possible in the United States. Women who wanted graduate degrees in the late part of the 19th century went to Europe and many of them ended up in Zurich. That was one of the few institutions that would grant them a degree. Um, a, a very interesting example of this phenomenon is Carrie Thomas. Many of you may have heard of her because she was the first dean and the very longtime president of Bryn Mawr College. Carrie Thomas enrolled in Johns Hopkins University after graduating from Cornell. She was given the syllabus and books 
but she was never allowed to attend classes. After two years of, of correspondence school, she decided that she would really like to go to the classes and attend them, and she went to Leipzig in Germany. She studied there for three years, completed all the requirements for a degree, including a dissertation, and when it became time for her to sit for her final examination, she wasn't allowed to do that. Um, she very, she wasn't a quitter, and she very abruptly packed her things and went to Zurich, where she was finally awarded her PhD on the basis of the thesis and examinations that she sat for there. In, that was in, 19, in 1882, excuse me. The first American woman to get a doctorate actually completed her degree before Carrie Thomas. Her name was Helen McGill, and she got a degree from BU in 1877, but this was very rare. Um, however, by 1900, women in the United States had received 228 doctorates from United States institutions. 36 of them were at Yale, which had opened its graduate school to women in 1893. I'd like you to keep this in mind. <laughs> Seven were at Columbia, 19 were at Penn, 28 were at Cornell, and one was at Brown. Now, there, there are a couple of schools conspicuously absent from this list of places granting degrees to women. One of them is Harvard University. Um, Harvard's philosophy department actually did admit women to classes in the early 1890s. And in 1895, Mary Calkins took and passed all the PhD exams and completed all the requirements for a degree. She wasn't granted one. And then in um, 1898, Ethel Puffer did the same thing. Ethel Puffer was so well qualified for this degree that the faculty who examined her deemed her unusually well qualified for the PhD proposed her name to the Harvard Corporation as a degree candidate, but the corporation refused to grant the PhD to her. The faculty, undaunted, appointed her a member of the philosophy department without the PhD. However, the corporation then refused to publish her name in the catalog of the list of the other faculty members. They did that, in their own words, for fear that it would create a dangerous precedent. <laughs> Okay. In 1902, Harvard formed the Radcliffe Graduate School and offered both women, Mary Calkins and Ethel Puffer, Radcliffe doctorates. Only Ethel Puffer accepted. Mary Calkins said it would be a Harvard PhD or nothing at all. Harvard did not offer doctorates to women under the Harvard name until 1963. But Radcliffe doesn't have its own faculty, and women were in the Harvard Graduate School taking courses there and receiving degrees, as we said, in the beginning of the 19th century. So here we are. We have Harvard and Yale there in this period in the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, where women are beginning to receive American doctorates. Where was Princeton? Well, Princeton was here, but <laughs> women weren't. <laughs> okay. uh, Princeton did form its graduate school right around the turn of the 19th century. But, as I think all of you realize, because we're celebrating co-education today, there was not a woman in Princeton's graduate school as a degree candidate until 1961. That woman is here with us today. Her name is Sabra Miservi. The second year, she came in the fall of 61. The second year of graduate school co-education, eight women were admitted as degree candidates. Now, there's something very interesting about these first several years of graduate school co-education. These women were admitted on the theory that we had special resources here at Princeton and that they couldn't receive the degrees in their fields of specialty anywhere else except here. So I think we could call this early period the need to know age. <laughs> Beginning in 1966, the entire graduate school was open to women. And the rest, as you can see, is history. So today, what we'd like to do is um, have women who are here from across this 28-year span who will tell you about their experiences. They're going to tell you about not only their experiences here, they'd like to, they're going to talk to you a little bit about what happened after they left Princeton. And I think that we really have two goals here this morning. We have a lot to celebrate. We finally caught up with Harvard and Yale. 
which, and we have also many fine women who have come through the Princeton Graduate School. We're very proud of them. We're here to recognize them. We're also here to think about what unanswered questions there are and what lies in the future. And I think after we speak, we'd like to hear from all of you and hear what you think about these issues. So, let me begin by introducing Sabra Missouri Toback. She received her BA degree from Barnard College, summa cum laude. She was a member of Phi Beta Kappa, president of the Student Government Association, and received the Murray Fellowship for the senior most likely to succeed in the social sciences. She also received an MA in Modern European History from Columbia University. She taught at the American Schools for Girls in Istanbul, Turkey, and then she became an instructor of history at Douglas College. At the time that she came to Princeton, therefore, she already had a graduate degree. She was teaching at Douglas College, which is in New Brunswick, as many of you know. She was married and she had three children. She was a very special case. Her application, as I understand it, was the process a year and a half before you began, Sabra? Or two. Or two, okay. Took some time. <laughs> so this was a very special moment in Princeton's history. Before I invite her to speak to you, I'd just like to tell you that her distinctions didn't end when she finished her Princeton degree in 1966. She went back to Douglas where she was an assistant professor of history. Then she became professor of history and chairman of the Department of Social Science at Mercer County Community College. She later became the associate dean of the faculty at Mercer County Community College and then acting president of Dutchess Community College. After that, she was the Dean of Academic Affairs, also at Duchess, and she is currently a lecturer in history at SUNY at New Paltz. I'd like you to welcome Sabra Missouri, Princeton's first degree candidate. Thank you, and good morning. It's nice to be back here. I think I'm going to be a disappointment to most of you, despite all of those very splendid things that have been said. I don't think my reactions to Princeton are quite the common ones or quite the expected ones. For about 28 years, people have been telling me what Princeton meant to me, and I have been persuading them that I really looked at it differently and they conclude by saying, well, maybe you didn't understand what was happening to you. <laughs> I suppose that's possible. I've learned some things about women at Princeton. I'm not selling books like Jim Wright, but some of you know this book, Women Reflect About Princeton, which is bits and pieces of writings by women from several generations of Princeton education. It's moving. Some of the young women particularly express considerable anger. Some express considerable satisfaction. One particularly struck me, young woman, undergraduate, who wrote, people kept asking me whether I liked Princeton. I finally decided I loved Princeton and I hated Princeton, but I didn't like it. I think I liked it. I don't think I was in love with it, and I certainly didn't hate it. Somehow or other, everything I've done seems to have gotten a name after I did it. First of all, I was a teenager when the word didn't exist. I suspect there are one or two of you here who share that with me. Then I think I was a feminist before I claimed to be a feminist, not particularly self-conscious about that. And I learned about 10 days ago for the first time that I've always been on the mommy track. I've never <laughs> heard of that. And heaven knows what's gonna happen next. My trip to Princeton began in the fall of 1959, and it was the result of a certain kind of collusion, I think. I was talking to the then very distinguished 
Dean of Douglas College, Polly Bunting, Mary and Graham Bunting, who uh, was here at Princeton for a time as well and on to the Radcliffe Women's Institute. Talking about my return to finish graduate study, and she said, have you considered Princeton? And I said, don't be silly, they don't take women. She said, well, I was having dinner last week with Bob Goheen, and he said, we're about ready for a test case. Do you know anybody? <laughs> How would you like to go with me to see Bob Goheen and talk about it? And so I did. And Bob Goheen, you'll be interested to hear this, Lisa, among other things, said to me with great dignity, Princeton has always educated women. It just hasn't given them degrees. He said, I suggest that you come, that you take the courses, that you write the papers, that you take the final exam, that you write a dissertation, and we will write you a letter saying you have done these things. I was on a very high, indignant horse <laughs> and said, Bob, how can I have a career in academic higher education in America with a letter saying I did those things? I think I almost caught him winking at me. And I think that he wanted to be in a position to say to any particular old alumnus who asked, I tried everything I really did. Anyway. So jokes began and waiting began and people were saying such things as, you're gonna let women go to Princeton, you don't want your brother to marry a woman, do you? <laughs> and things of that kind. And then by the fall of 1961, we assembled my entering graduate class. For the Department of Oriental Studies, it was an enormous class. There were eight of us. Of course, I had just come out of a class of 250 at Columbia, so it seemed to me very small and very special. And what I found out, and this is where I part company with some of the women in the book, I found out that I was quite different from the others in ways in which gender was totally insignificant. I was considerably older. I had, as Lisa said, been teaching at Rutgers for eight years. I'd lived abroad. I had three children, the oldest of whom was halfway through high school. Age, I think, and life experience was a greater factor than, in fact, was gender. And I also found out that among the people in that entering class were people who didn't particularly know that Princeton had never taken women. Graduate students, as everybody here knows, are something of a different breed from undergraduate students. I did have to get myself accepted by my group, and I suggest still more because of age than because of sex, and I know when that happened. One of my classmates in that slough of despond that happens to graduate students where you think they're going to lock you in the library and throw away the key, had gone across the street to the wine and game shop and had come back with a bottle of cognac in a brown paper bag and he slumped down into the Oriental study study room in the library, and he took the top off his cognac, and he took a big swig, and he passed it to the next student. And then he looked up, and who's there? Little old lady in tennis shoes, quite <laughs> literally. <laughs> and I saw him stop, and I saw him wonder if I was going to sick the cops on him, tell his mommy, or what I was going to do. I think he was going to put it back on, take it away, and pretend he didn't exist. I said to him, John, there are paper cups in the ladies' room. 
And he said, there are. There aren't any paper cups in the men's room. Go get some. <laughs> so I went, and I got paper cups from the ladies' room, and I suspect they're still there, fourth floor of Firestone Library. And I suspect there still aren't any in the men's room. And we all had cognac, and I was one of the crowd, if not one of the boys. I cannot totally credit Princeton, I think, with an intellectual curiosity, I think is part of my equipment, because I think I brought it with me to Princeton, but it certainly didn't do anything to stifle it. And if anything, enhanced and encouraged and moved me along in that direction. I have to say, the most exciting intellectual adventure I have ever had, I had at Princeton. It was a course. It was a course in the history of Safavid Persia. It was taught by Professor Martin Dixon. There were eight of us in that course. This is not the same entering eight, but there were eight of us. We took to that course different skills and abilities, different usabilities of language. Martin Dixon spent all of every week, and I know because I saw him do it, making the assignments for this class, using language materials that would stretch and enhance and inspire and most particularly challenge every student. One who knew Russian did all the Russian sources. One who knew Greek did all the Greek sources. I did all the German sources, and let me tell you, there were plenty of them. This is a field in which German scholarship is preeminent. But my assignment, and everybody's was like this, my assignment was all of the German, four pages perhaps of modern Turkish in which I was making some progress three paragraphs of Ottoman Turkish, which was a lot slower and harder, and two sentences of Arabic. He did that for each of the eight of us. And the eight of us taught the course. We put those pieces together like a Byzantine mosaic. And when we had finished each Thursday night and they threw us out of the library because it was closing, we had put together a rich and colorful and sumptuous portrait of some piece of South of it history. I wish I could do that. I was never able to duplicate that. And in my roles of academic leadership, I was never really able to push anybody else into doing that, even though that was a unique and extraordinary feat. And I associate it, essentially, with Princeton. Came to graduation time. Graduation was historic, not because it was mine, because of the honorary degrees that were given the year I got my degree. One of those was to Philip Hitty, the grand old man of the Department of Oriental Studies, who had in a way founded it. If not, he had made it famous. He was one of those resources which I was allowed to come and use. Philip Hitty was the first person in our study room every morning. He was then approaching his mid-80s, and he reigned over the rest of us in a benign and fatherly or grandfatherly kind of way. That was exciting. More exciting than that was an honorary degree to Robert Oppenheimer. Robert Oppenheimer was at that time already ill with the cancer that would kill him. He was being restored by reputation to the mainstream of American life. And it was indeed very exciting that a piece of that rehabilitation of his reputation was delivered to him by Princeton University, a 
as a kind of an apology for what our society had in fact done to him and been doing to him. That was a proud moment for Princeton, in my opinion. After graduation, I did other disappointing things in a way. I didn't become the scholar of uh, Turkish history or of Oriental languages that perhaps I was supposed to. What I did, if you listened to the brief introduction, was move into institutions with open access. Went from Douglas, which was very far from having open access, but is a public university or a piece of a public university, to two community colleges, which not only allow people out of the 18 to 22 year old male group, but encourage and where there are many people of many different kinds and many different ages and both sexes. And I don't think it's chance that I chose to move off in that direction. Ended by deciding I had somehow along the line, foolishly, lost my diploma, called up the department to say, did I lose it? Did you send it to me? What have I done? How have I goofed? And she said, oh no, we haven't sent it to you yet. They're still translating it into the feminine. So about three years after 1966, it came in the mail. Said I, better late than never. I have to end by telling you the best joke I ever made. I think I made it. And I hope I made it. And if I didn't, I'm certainly jealous of whoever did. When I was a student at Princeton, I had an operation, which shall be nameless, but it is an operation which can only happen to a woman. Down the road, a piece in Princeton Hospital. I woke up, found my doctor sitting on my bed, chuckling. I said, stop that, it hurts and it isn't funny. And he said, do you want to know what you said under the sodium pentothal? And I said, I suppose so. And he said, you said, you should consider this an honor. Nobody has ever done it to a Princeton student before. <laughs> That was another great first for Princeton. I'm so happy you told us about it. Hey. Um, we are not only honored by the presence of Sabra Missouri Toback this morning, we have with us today the woman who received the very first degrees that Princeton ever granted to a woman. Her name is Sai Ying Chang. She came here that second year in 1963 from the Department of Microbiology at the University of Illinois. She received her PhD in 1964, so she was very nice. She gave us an actual anniversary today. It's 25 years since Princeton awarded a doctorate to a woman. After a series of academic positions, she became the first woman full professor at the Oregon Graduate Center. In 1980, Sai Cheng decided that she wanted to do what she thought was important. She was going to find her own money and she was going to pursue her own dreams. She founded and is now the president and owner of TC Plant. She applies her scientific expertise to developing horticultural products and improving propagation methods. I think she has over 300, is that right? 300 species of Japanese maples, as well as a new type of bonsai that will be commercially available, if it isn't already. Is, that, is it already available? So I'd like you all to welcome Princeton's first woman degree recipient, Tai Ying Chang. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, after Sabra's talk, <laughs> Lisa's talk, I 
I'm a little bit nervous, I have to say, <laughs> because I'm poor in uh, presentation. And uh, I tried to juggle on something last night, but I just couldn't do it. So I'm just going to speak from my head. I came from very, very different background from all of you. From, I was very young. I was taught in Confucius teaching that woman without virtue is the best. You just have to follow men, whoever you marry to, and then just do whatever you, your husband wants you to do. So in a sense that woman is not an independent entity. It's, a, it's part of the apparatus of men. With that in mind, my curiosity about wanting to know something new from I was very young, make me in, put me into a very odd position. I was very sensitive. I always feel that I was different from other people because I was doing something different from others. But I didn't mind because whatever I was doing interested me a great deal that I could ignore all the others. By the time I finished my graduate school, I mean undergrad school in Taiwan, I was ready to come to this country. I applied to two schools, Vassar College and the University of Illinois. Both universities gave me fellowship, but I decided that since I have to fight in the men's world, I should not go to Vassar College because that's women's college. At least Illinois is a core education. I will have much broader exposure to all kinds of environments, all kinds of circumstances in such a way that will prepare me to go into the real world. I went to Illinois. There was 1960, if I remember. You know, correct? <laughs> it's been a long time. I'm old. <laughs> All I can say is that. <laughs> I'll never tell you if you're wrong. <laughs> After about one month at Illinois, I got to know my advisor. He just came from Harvard University. He was still unpacking his equipment. And uh, I also got to know some other professors. And they all have 10 or 20 graduate students. And I was very nervous. I was new in this country. And uh, even my field was new to me because at Taiwan, I was majoring in biology. And uh, in Illinois, there was microbiology. And most of the professors are doing what at that time is the frontier, molecular biology. It's all about DNA. I thought that I should choose this new professor just came to Illinois because I will get his personal attention. So after one month, I went to him. I said, I would like to be your student. Then I thought that that's, that's what's the end of it. But second day, I got a phone call from him. He said, aren't you coming to the lab and work? I did not have to start working so soon. <laughs> so I went to the lab and he, he gave me the problem. And uh, I didn't know what to say because I took biochemistry class in Taiwan and the professor was from medical school and his expertise was in nutrition so he spent awful lots of time talking about this nutrition. If you are lacking this vitamin, you see this kind of symptom, that kind of symptom. But come to genetics, nucleic acids, he said, well, this chapter, you just go home and study. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I guess I went home, I didn't study. So uh, when my advisor gave me that problem, I was in big trouble. I spent day and the night in the laboratory trying to find out what DNA is, what's up to date <laughs> information about DNA, and then I started doing the experiments. It was very hard, but I spent day and the night, weekday and the weekend, 
and uh, try to figure out how to do the experiments. After about six months, I have enough data to publish three papers in science, National Academy of Sciences, PNS, and uh, also Journal of American Biology. My advisor was impressed. <laughs> so when he was offered a position at Princeton University, he asked me whether I would like to come to Princeton with him to get a degree here. I didn't know there was no woman in Princeton. <laughs> but I know Princeton because coming from Taiwan, uh, all the important positions in the government are occupied by those people who have a degree from Princeton, Yale, Harvard, you know, all those Ivy Leagues. So when he asked me that, I said, well, no question I go to Princeton. <laughs> I didn't know how hard Princeton is. <laughs> Just the name because you know, I said, oh guys, I, if I ever go back to Taiwan, I will be able to get those top position. That's what I had in my mind. <laughs> so I came here. I was so involved in my research because that was the most exciting part of the beginning of molecular biology. Western and the cricket just decipher the structure of DNA. And uh, my advisor's laboratory, by the way, I should mention his name, Dr. Noboro Suoka, is one of the top laboratories. We have visitors from all over the world and are all are top. And just to be able to get in touch with those people, those scientists, to, to see how they think, how they perform, how they talk, how they walk, just, just an inspiration. I thought that was the best experience I have in Princeton. It's also set up such a high standard that, that I develop a kind of maybe inferiority complex. I wish how much I wish I could be one of those, but <laughs> But my ability is limited by what God gave me. And uh, I, all I can say is I have to do the best I can and uh, satisfied with that. That's, but those are the scientists that really inspire me. Besides those scientists, two things at Princeton also affect me a great deal, even to now. There was the beginning of civil rights. I did get involved in huge civil rights activities. And also, there was at the peak of Vietnam War. And uh, I even heard Madame News speech, the Jordan lady. And those two things affect me a great deal. In addition to science, make me feel like I also have to pay attention to the events that are affecting our life. When I finish my thesis, I was told that I will be the first one to receive a PhD degree from Princeton. I'm a very private person, and uh, I know that first degree has some kind of burden on me because people always want to know, what's this first one did? How good is she? You know, how, much, how far can she go? You know? So I try to keep a very low profile, but it's not possible. <laughs> I have to say that Sabra is the worst one. Actually, is the one actually she had the first degree. Because when I re finished my PhD thesis, all the requirements, uh, university cannot tell from my first name whether I'm a female or male. <laughs> I did have American first name when I just came to this country, but I realized that American consists of people from all the nations, and we should understand all different kinds of names. So I changed back to my Chinese name. So with my Chinese name, for university, it's very hard to tell that I'm female or male. So they just put my name in the male diploma in such a way that there are about 28 mistakes in my diploma. <laughs> After several years, 
I think after quite a few years after I graduated, uh, I got a letter from university to say that now we have the right diploma. Would I like to change to the right ones? <laughs> if I would, I could send my old one back, the original one back, and they will issue me new ones. But I wrote back, I said I prefer to keep my original one. That's what I got, so I can stay with that. <laughs> University didn't prepare me to face the world. I was, I didn't prepare myself to face the world. For the few years after uh, graduation, postdoctoral work was very rewarding. You, I went to Johns Hopkins Institute for Cancer Research and Brookhaven National Laboratory. Because of the nature of my research, I have to stay at top organizations because we require such a many equipments and also research fund. While I was in those organizations, I realized that most of the women scientists are just stay as a research associate. To me, it's a glorified technician. I might be wrong, but that's the way I feel. I feel very strongly. Uh, I don't see any woman on staff. I start to question about the system. I, I look at all those women research associates. They are top-notch scientists. But how come they stay as a supporting staff for the male principal investigators? I guess I'm not 100% devoted to science that I willing to accept that position. If I, my science, my work is good, I also want to have the right position. I want to be a staff. But that was very hard because it, to get PhD, that's relatively easy. All you have to do is finish your requirements, then you get your PhD. There's a criteria to judge your performance. To get a staff position, there's no criteria. It's very subjective. Uh, one place told me because I don't have citizenship. I told them all I have to do is to pay $25 to get my citizenship. I think the reason is deeper than that. But they insist it's because I don't have citizenship. When I was at Kevin, they gave me a position of senior research associate. The faculties feel guilty about that, but they, they feel they are uncomfortable to give me a full staff position, but they would like me to go to a staff meeting to show that there's women on the staff meeting. <laughs> I refused to go. I said, well, you, my, project, my title is not a right title to go into the staff meeting. I've refused to go. I was in a very difficult position. I know my research was good. I was qualified to get, get staff position, but I couldn't get it. And I wasn't satisfied to be just in somebody's laboratory. I was looking for a way out. I was willing to sacrifice my science and uh, just to get out. I didn't know quite how to do it because at that time I was doing cancer research. I didn't really want to go to in industry because I was spent one year at DuPont Experimental Station as a chemist. And uh, I wasn't ready to go to, to go to industry. So I thought that maybe if I were to go to medicine, I could be an independent position. Uh, I like the idea very much, so I applied to medical school. But at that time, I was too late because they said I was too old and I was female. I couldn't get medical. I couldn't admit it to medical school. Then, while I was at Institute of Cancer Research, there's a laboratory doing the research on tobacco tumor. Uh, two species of tobaccos, Nicosiana gauca and Nicosiana longistophia, cause these two species or produce tumor. And uh, Dr. Hagen was doing research on that particular problem. It somehow gave me an idea that 
he was a plant physiologist. With my background, if I can tackle that problem, I could be on the top, perhaps will lead me to an independent position. I was willing to try that. So I feel very bad about it because I have to give up cancer research to pursue that. But to me at that time, it's very important for me to reach to the position that I want. So I switched to that and I was good in plant tissue culture research. And uh, when Oregon Graduate Center got a very good grant from Warhauser Company, that's the, one of the biggest timber company or paper uh, company, they hired a consultant to visit laboratories in this country, including Canada, doing the plant tissue culture work. And when this consultant came to Brookhaven, at that time I was at Brookhaven, he called Oregon Graduate Center, said that they found the right person for Oregon Graduate Center to lead the program. Uh, I was invited to Oregon, and uh, I was offered a associate professor position. I asked for full professorship because I said I'm qualified for full professorship. They couldn't give it to me because they said, you'll never be on staff. You have to start with associate <laughs> professor. <laughs> anyway, I said that. By the time I got there, I realized that I wasn't totally in charge of that program. They were so worried about this uh, small Chinese ladies. How can she handle this such a huge grant, huge grant? I decided that if they are to hire me as an associate professor and in charge of this uh, program, I should also have a control of the research grant. And uh, I didn't say anything. Uh, I just said I need a week vacation to go back east. They got the message. When I came back from east, they gave me 100% control of their projects. So finally, after all, my, all this year's struggle, I got the position that I deserve to have, and uh, I was very happy. I feel I have to make a statement for women. If I don't do it, for those women behind me, it will be much harder. If I succeed, it will be much easier for them to follow me. Once I reach that position, it's back in the mind when I was struggling to get my star position. I have an idea of how could I be become independent. And uh, once I reach that position, I don't have to worry about struggling for a faculty position anymore. Then I be, after a few years, I become restless. And the research at Oregon Graduate Center put me into contact with lots of timber industries and also nursery industries. I realized that in nursery business, you can start with big or small. When my research was at the peak, I got a venture capital uh, invest investors come to me to say, let's start laboratories. By working with so many people before, I feel like I want my freedom. I, I just want something on my own. So I turned on all that and start my own company. That was hard. That was beginning of 1980s. Everything was in, housing was in depressed state. Uh, but I stick with it and it looks like I'm going to see the lights from end of the tunnel. <laughs> That's all I can say. <laughs> well, people question about... <coughs> so, you give up the education Princeton gave you and doing something entirely different. Is there a waste for Princeton to educate you? I said no. Because of my pet science background, I can approach any problem I tackle in a scientific way, and that's the most important part.
Thank you. back to follow. <laughs> We're going to move a little forward into the years of Princeton's graduate women's education. Our next panelist is a member of the same department that I received my degree. Her name is Phyllis Thompson. She was also here at the same time that my husband was here, so I feel that between <coughs> us we cover many of the years of Princeton's graduate education. She received her BA in Anthropology from George Washington University. She was at Princeton from 1974 to 1977. She received an MA degree from Princeton. She taught in the Department of Theology at Georgetown University and then entered law school at the National Law Center of George Washington University in 1978. Since that time, she's been practicing with the Washington law firm of Covington and Burley. She specializes in Medicaid reimbursement matters. She's married. She has two very beautiful girls who are at the back of the room waiting to hear their mom speak. So with it, no further ado, Phyllis Thompson. Thanks. Good morning. I spent a good deal of time since I spoke to Don Drakeman a few months ago about this program, trying to figure out what I could say that would be of interest to anyone about my particular years at Princeton. And what I could say that would reflect on uh, women at Princeton generally, and I'm not altogether sure I've come up with anything of general interest, but I'll tell you some of my own observations, which in many ways are intensely personal and, and, and reflect, uh, I guess, on my own personality and background as much as anything else. Um, I, I am sure from some of the conversations I've had with people this morning that, that we have struck some common chords, but I'm not entirely sure that we struck them because we're all women. Um, but having said that, I'll, I'll tell you what my thoughts are. Um, I came to Princeton in the fall of 1974 as a graduate student in the Department of Religion, uh, where my concentration was Christian ethics. Uh, I, I came to Princeton very naive. I think I had really no preformed expectations about what I was going to do on the other side of my years here. Uh, I came from a family background and I guess a culture in general where there had been uh, a few college degrees, uh, probably no graduate college experience. I don't think I really knew personally anyone who had a graduate degree, and I'm not sure what I expected to find here. Uh, but I came because I was excited by my religion courses in college, and I knew only that I wanted to keep drinking in all that I could of those readings, and that I wanted to pursue discussions with people who had written the things that I had read and been impressed by, and that was a sufficient reason to come. I hadn't yet arrived at that point in my life where I much cared about how I was going to support myself or, or get ahead in the future, and so I really didn't think about what was on the other end. And I'm not even certain that I, that I thought or expected that I would become an academic or a teacher. I, I, I literally did not think any further than coming here and pursuing the things that were interesting to me. When I was in college, although I was an anthropology major, the courses that I found the most stimulating were my courses in religious thought. And, toward my, the end of my senior year, I had accumulated enough of those almost to have a double major and, and knew that that was the field that I wanted uh, to pursue. And I chose to come to Princeton because Paul Ramsey was here in the religion department. Um, I had read a number of his writings and in my mind he was the Christian ethicist and the writer who had in the most rigorous way tried to think through what the implications of, of Christian faith and religion's faith were for various modern moral dilemmas. I was fascinated by his writing. I was, I was awestruck, I think, and I wanted to come and study with this man. And the, the possibility of coming to a small graduate department where I could have daily one-on-one -on -one contact uh, to me seemed like bliss, nirvana, and so I came. And yet I, I had no idea what was going to be on the other side of it. Um, I arrived and I think I was in shock, basically, and I must say that I was not particularly happy during my years at Princeton. Um, and, and my unhappiness, I think, is attributable to, to two things, primarily. Uh, one was that I really had no sense of direction, as I've told you, and I was not really prepared for a graduate curriculum where there were a uh, few course requirements, 
uh, uh, few required readings and where I had a great deal of liberty to plot out my own course. I think I would have been very happy to have arrived and to have been told that I must take these 20 courses and read these 500 books and, and write these 32 papers. I, I'd have been delighted with that. Uh, I was never overburdened by the workload, but I think I never did quite acquire a sense of direction. Uh, I stayed here three years. I took my general exams and passed them after the end of the second year, and I spent another year uh, serving as Professor Ramsey's teaching assistant and, and trying very hard to develop a dissertation proposal, but, but basically directionless. And I did, by the end of that third year, submit a proposal that won approval, but I felt rather lukewarm about it, and I think I always knew I would never, I would never carry it off. Um, I was still fascinated by my studies, uh, but part of the problem was that most people that I knew back at home couldn't figure out what in the world I was doing and what I was about and what in the world I was ever going to be if I ever grew up. And I'm not sure I knew either. And, and I, I, I mean this very, very sincerely, that I would go to family gatherings and I would see people I had gone to college and high school with and they would say, what are you doing? And I would say, well, I'm a graduate student at Princeton. I'm studying religious ethics. What? <laughs> I'm studying religious ethics. Well, what is that? And I would try to explain, and they would say, well, and, and, and what are you going to do with that when you finish? Well, I'm probably going to, to teach. Well, but what would you do if you couldn't teach? Well, I, I don't know. And what would you do if you weren't doing what you're doing now? I, 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 I'm certain that the questions were foolish, but I was sufficiently uh, insecure not, not to realize that then, and I didn't have a very good answer, and, and it troubled me. Um, I had been a, a good student all of my life. I had been the smartest girl in the class throughout high school and college and the like. And I was, I was used to achieving. And I think that my family and my community had great expectations for me. And they were looking to see me arrive at something uh, where they could put me into a nice pigeonhole and say that she had become a whatever, something that everyone understood. <laughs> and I think unconsciously I really bought into that and had the sense that I, that I had not succeeded and could not succeed unless I could fulfill that. And I think uh, that, that, real, that plus my sense of direction contributed to my inability to really appreciate uh, all that was here at Princeton. And so uh, at the end of that third year, though I could have stayed on and could have written the dissertation, I, I decided to, to look for opportunities uh, at home. And as it turned out, there was a need for someone to serve as a sabbatical replacement at Georgetown University in Washington during that following year uh, in the Department of Theology. And so I was hired as an instructor, and I taught full-time at Georgetown during that year, teaching Christian ethics, the, the love of my life, and also teaching some introductory courses uh, in religious thought. I did that for a year. Um, I think it was only during the course of my teaching that I really started to appreciate how much I had learned here and how comprehensive my knowledge had really become. I, I had the sense of floating through without much direction and I was not really certain I had covered the things I was supposed to cover because after all there was not that required reading list and that core curriculum that I was supposed to take. But when I tried to draw upon all that I had learned and I knew in order to develop my own courses, I was actually startled and astonished at how much there was to put into my courses. And I loved teaching. Uh, I, I felt that I was on many days uh, exciting my students' minds in the same way that mine had been excited when I was an undergraduate student. And I was convinced that this had all made sense after all. I never acquired the, the sufficient sense of direction to do that dissertation, I must say, but I love teaching. <laughs> Uh, but there was that side of me still that, that wanted to become something that everyone recognized. And so I applied to law school, and I think my reasons for doing so were no more lofty than that. I, I, I try to convince myself that what I had in mind was to become a great poverty lawyer and to, to do some type of legal work that would uh, advance society. But I think the truth of it is as simple that I wanted a professional degree in a professional career that would make people stop asking me, well, what are you going to do next? <laughs> and so I went to law school. I, I went to law school at the end of my first year of teaching full-time at Georgetown, but I did manage to hold on to a part-time teaching position, and so I was a lecturer for the next six semesters at Georgetown, and, and I was able to, to satisfy that part of my life while pursuing the law degree. And at the end of that three years, when I graduated from law school, I guess I gave up my academic career because I went to practice at a large Washington law firm where I've been ever since. And I uh, stumbled into a rather unusual area, which is uh, Medicaid reimbursement litigation. I, I represent state governments 
uh, against the federal government when the federal government is trying to reclaim uh, dollars given to the states to, to pay for medical assistance programs. And I represent state governments against hospitals and nursing homes who claim they're not being paid enough. Um, and I like my work a great deal. I like the clients that I serve. Um, I have the sense of, of being in government service while in a private law firm. It's, it's a wonderful mix. And I deal on a daily basis with, with social services commissioners and, and people of that sort who grapple with fiscal problems that all the states have. And it's a tremendously satisfying career, and, and yet I still think it's not enough. Um, when I spoke to Don a few months ago and he told me, well, let me back up and tell you that Don and I have a great deal in common. Not only were we here at Princeton together back in the mid-70s, but Don left Princeton to go to law school as well, and so we were true soulmates. <laughs> But when I spoke to Don a few months ago, he told me, lo and behold, he had come back. And he had written his dissertation. And he struck a chord in me that I wasn't really sure was still there uh, to be struck. And I knew that I still wanted to do mine, too. In fact, I guess I still do want to do it. I'm not sure it's possible, and I'm not appealing to anybody out there. Because <laughs> I suspect it's going to be a long time before I... A long time before I'm really serious about this. I have two small children, ages three and seven, and an extremely busy law practice, and few moments in my day to think about doing anything else. And yet, I think I have now come to understand what the dissertation is. I, I think I thought many years ago that somehow it had to be something of ultimate significance that, that uh, drew together everything um, that I had ever learned and that would solve some eternal problem out there. <laughs> I don't know why I thought that, but I thought that. I don't think so anymore, and I know full well there are some things I have to say that I could have said, and, and, and so maybe at some point in my life I will do it. Um, the other reason that I was unhappy at Princeton, I think, is because I suffered from a tremendous lack of confidence. I think that's something that almost everyone here seems to have. And none of us is sure that he or she is quite smart enough or quite good enough to compete with the others. And I certainly felt that. And uh, when I think back upon my years here, that's the cloud with which I think about it, that I suffered under a, a constant burden, a kind of oppression of not being quite sure I belonged. To tell you the truth, I don't know why. I, after I talked to Don, I got to thinking about my years at Princeton, and I went into my basement, and I pulled out some old papers and notes that I had. And I stumbled upon a seminar paper that I wrote during my first year here. I remember working very hard on it, but I really couldn't remember much of what it was about, nor could I really remember what the re reaction to it had been. And I picked it up, and I started to read it. It was an analytical look at the black Muslim movement in America, something I did for a first year uh, religion seminar. I was fascinated when I read it. It was really a very good paper, I must say. <laughs> I was astonished. The, the analysis was really very good. And for the first time, I thought, you know, my years at Princeton were really not wasted because I had really learned to do the kind of in-depth analysis that serves me even in my law practice today. And I think I had the same feeling that you had, that somehow I had wasted my time here because I had moved to something else. And it was a couple of months ago, thanks to Don, that I, that I realized for the first time that I hadn't, because I am certain that the analytical skills that go into my legal briefs today were really sharpened and honed here, and I could see that in that seminar paper. Uh, it was a very good paper. Um, I, I, there was a friend that I had here at Princeton, Paula Richmond, who was in our class, and Paula went on and is now teaching at Oberlin College in the Department of Religion, and several years ago, she asked me for a copy of this paper that she knew I had worked on when we were students here together, and I thought, I really don't know why she wants it. It was an awful paper. I never bothered to reread it, but I sent it to her. I couldn't imagine why she wanted it. When I read it, I could see why she wanted it. It was a very useful, um, and I, I, I say this not to praise myself, but I say it to tell you who are here now that you, that the depths of depression into which you can fall, questioning your own abilities, are so deep that you can manage to convince yourself that you never did anything good, and it's just not so. The, the most amazing part of it, though, was that I got to the end of the paper, and <laughs> I've got great competition. I got to the end of the paper, and attached to it were the comments of my professors. And the first one read, this was a marvelously written seminar paper. And I looked at that, and I said, did I not see this before? How could I have failed to see this? Surely I saw it, but somehow I had so much convinced myself 
that I did not belong and that I wasn't adequate, that it never soaked into consciousness. I was astonished. I brought the paper upstairs with me and I have it sitting nearby. I was utterly astonished. Um, I, I do not know how I permitted myself to sink into such depression and to have such a lack of confidence while I was here, but that was certainly the hallmark of my years here. And I think uh, they, they really crippled me in some ways and made me unable to really stay and pursue what what I now see is what I wanted to do most of my life and what or perhaps I will finish. Um, and, and so I guess if, if there's any message, it's a message that goes to current students and not just to women students, but, you, but you, it, it is so easy to, to lose sight uh, of your abilities. Um, but as I say, the rest of what I learned is that um, it is entirely too easy to buy into the notion that you have made good use of your Princeton education only if you have become an academic and you have have joined the faculty of a great university. Um, it, it serves you in so many ways. I see it from my own analytic skills, and I certainly see it from the kind of broad background that, that what I learned here has given me. And, and I know now that it's very valuable. So that by the time I had gone through all of this recent thought process, I was very excited about coming back here. Um, and in some ways, it was enabling, enabling me finally to, to put some closure to a period of my life about which I had uh, still uh, great painful memories and and in other ways uh, it enabled uh, me to to open up again I guess ties to, to a university about which I felt ambivalent and I found myself very excited actually as I was bringing my daughters here and my older daughter who was seven said to me maybe I'll come to school here mom and <laughs> and you know I smiled and I never thought that I would smile about that but I did <laughs> smile. so maybe she will um, and having said all that I, I I say again, I'm not sure that any of this has any particular relevance to the place of women at Princeton. Uh, I, I, like some of my colleagues here, really didn't know that, uh, that uh, women had been here for so few years when I came. Uh, I, I really did come naive. Um, I have never particularly been uh, or felt constrained by being a woman, um, nor have I particularly felt constrained by being black, but I, but I do think that what is very significant in my own background is, is, is what I guess the sociologists would call a, a probable lack of a, a deprivation, I guess, a kind of cultural and social deprivation that, that made no place in my family circles and community circles for, for graduate education. I think it's still not appreciated and, and, and that more than anything is the obstacle that made it difficult for me to stay and, and to achieve my goals. Um, but I, I think I have thought through that hurdle and overcome it in some ways if not others and so I I'm now rather enamored of the possibility of sending my daughter here, so <laughs> that kind of is, is, is the result. Um, and uh, I guess that's about it. I'm, I'm not sure what else I, what I have, to have to offer on the subject, but I, it's been a lot of fun. And I, I thank you very much for doing this because uh, uh, it's, it, it is a great cause, I think, to celebrate graduate education here, but it's, uh, a, it's also a great cause when each of us personally can, can kind of go through this thought process and put things in place, and it's certainly helped me to do that. Thanks. Before we go to our next panelist, I just have a question. Is there a way to shut this door? So that, is there a way to lock this door, do you know? And you could just fit? Here we go. There we go. <laughs> okay. Uh, our next panelist received her Princeton PhD in 1982. She re received her bachelor's degree in electrical engineering from Lehigh University in 1977. She was a Marshall Scholar at Imperial College in London, England from 1977 to 78. After she received her PhD, she worked for a year at the Institute for Defense Analysis in Princeton. Then she worked at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory at Caltech in Pasadena, California. Since September of 1985, she's been back at the Institute for Defense Analysis, where her main interest is digital signal processing, that is, computer algorithms for analyzing and processing signals. I'd like you to welcome a very distinguished woman scientist from Princeton, Maureen Quirk. One of the themes today has been, why did we come to Princeton? Well, some of the people here seem to have come sort of accidentally. Well, I came on purpose. Um, when I was an undergraduate and 
I guess I was going into senior year, one of my professors noticed that he hadn't been asked to write any letters of recommendation for me to graduate school. And because as an engineer, it had sort of never occurred to me that graduate school was a thing to do. Most engineers go for a four-year degree and then go into industry. But since I was at the top of the class, they thought it was obvious that I should go to graduate school. So um, I started to apply to graduate schools and meanwhile had filled out one of the Marshall Scholars applications and managed to actually get one of the scholarships to go study in England for two years. And it, I, I sort of went to my first university um, to get a graduate degree by accident because since I got a Marshall Scholar, it didn't, scholarship, it didn't seem like the thing to turn down and I hadn't really decided where to go to school and so I went off to England to, want, to their major technical university to go to school for a graduate degree. Well, that turned out to be a mistake. It wasn't a mistake in the sense that while I was there I learned that I didn't want to be there, but it was a mistake in the sense that, that in um, England, even more in this, than in this country, engineers are not considered um, quite the same as a real scholar who went to Cambridge or, or Oxford. And my mistake with the Marshall Scholar was not choosing to go to Cambridge and become a mathematician, but instead thinking that, that an engineering school there would be as good as one here. But um, while I was there, I did do research for a year, and I spent my time reading a lot of journal papers and, and finding out where people who were doing the work I was interested in were teaching. And it turned out that they were at Cornell and at Princeton. And I had previously applied to Cornell and Princeton and been accepted, so I tried to rejuvenate those applications and was able to do so successfully. So I went to interview in Cornell. In fact, the people whose papers I'd been reading had left. So <laughs> luckily I found this out before I enrolled there. And I, went, I came to Princeton and the department was, was um, doing exactly the kind of work that I was interested in doing. And that is sort of um, pushing the state of knowledge about what, you can, what kind of information you can extract from a signal. Now, people might not know what I'm talking about, about that, but I have, an, I have a sort of example. You've all seen an electrocardiogram on TV. You've seen the, the trace of a scope. Well, how, does, you know, how do you get information from that picture? Well, the doctors just look at it. Well, that's nice, but I mean, do you have to pay a doctor you know, $6,000 an hour to come look at an electrocardiogram scope? Maybe you could have a computer you know, do something about that. Surely it could measure the distance between the peaks and tell you the heart rate. You know, look for little side things that indicate heart murmurs or, or problems with the closing of the valves and things like that. So that's a kind of an example of, a, of a, the kind of work that I'd like to do. Although I never work with biological signals, the kinds of algorithms that I, that I work with um, are applicable to those areas. Um, so I came to Princeton knowing that the, that the faculty here were working in the field in which I was interested. And I think that's a big plus because I I think I got academically at Princeton what I expected, and I think I had the right kinds of expectations. Whereas the first graduate school I went to, I didn't bother to think about what to expect, but when I got there I found out that I had had expectations which, which weren't met. So um, one thing recently, I read excerpts from this Women Reflect About Princeton book, and I was very disappointed because all the excerpts I read seemed to be negative, and I really loved Princeton. And I wrote one of the, into one of these things. I don't know if it got in there or not, but I wrote that I really love Princeton. You know? <laughs> I don't know how many other people you know, wrote things like that, but I didn't see them in the excerpts that I read in the alumni bulletin and, and places like that. Um, one thing that I didn't find met my expectations in Princeton were not academic things, but, but lifestyle sort of things. The first thing was coming here and, and they said, here's your room number. So you come to the graduate calls and here's your room. And there's two rooms. I thought, that's wonderful. Bedroom and study. No, <laughs> that's not true. My roommate appeared shortly thereafter and, and clearly she needed to have one of these rooms. So we spent the next year, she tripped over me getting to the bathroom and I tripped over her getting out the door. But luckily we got along very well and, and in fact having a roommate meant that I had a social life in the sense that there was at least one other person that I had to interact with, no matter how depressed I got. I did have to go through her room and say hello in order to get out the door in the morning, unless I climbed through my window, <laughs> which, you know, we, we did sometimes, but, but never mind. We lost our keys. 
Um, so one thing I found as a graduate student here is that it's a very isolating experience. Here are all these famous you know, people with all these papers and they all seem to know what they're doing and, and most of the other graduate students I had the impression sort of thought they knew what they were doing. That's a false impression of course, but everybody tries to, to exude that. And so it's, it's very isolating mentally in, in that sense because here you are and, and you're not as good as everybody else. But it's also very isolating socially because the main activities on campus that, that are meant to draw people together in order to let them have the opportunity to meet other people are based on the undergraduates. And the undergraduates are separated from the graduate students by age and geography. Here we are over here. We, they, we don't even necessarily know where the undergraduate dorms are. Class of 90, 1932 dorm, how do we know that that's any different from the class of 1934 dorm? And we're not, you know, we're not invited to their parties with little um, eight and a half by eleven pieces of paper announcing them and things like that. So it is very isolating here. And the year I came, the social life was practically dead because the social committee was serving their second year and they got tired of trying to convince people to come to some parties and things. So somebody talked me into becoming social chairman. I guess I complained a little bit too loudly once at dinner. So I became social chairman and uh, the, the group of people that there were four social chairmen when I was here and the group was very dynamic and we discovered a formula for having parties. Well, you can't meet people unless you get people to a party. Once there are people there, it's a party. Well, graduate students, all you have to do is, is supply food and they will come. <laughs> and so that was our, our main thing. We would have a party every month. We'd find some sort of a theme, Halloween, you know, Thanksgiving, Christmas, whatever, and um, have some food, which we had a very wonderful chef at the graduate college who was always willing to prepare things for us and order things and there was a, a budget specially set up for this. So, so that was nice and I don't know what happened to things after I left but I felt that we, um, that we did something to increase the number of people who weren't quite so lonely at the graduate college. No matter what, it certainly did so for me because I had to meet all these people. I had to be at the party because I was <laughs> supposed to be organizing it. So I met a lot of people and in fact met my husband here. So, which may be part of the reason why I loved my years at Princeton. Um, since I left Princeton, I really have done exactly the kind of thing you might expect someone with a degree like mine from Princeton to do. That is, I've continued to do research in the area in which I got my dissertation, digital signal processing, spectrum analysis, and things like that. I've worked on some very interesting problems, and I've also um, worked on some problems which I can go talk to people like fifth graders who love math. And, you often find amongst fifth graders that the women, the, the girls really love math and by the time they're in sixth grade they think math is for boys. And one thing that you have to try to do is to reverse that, that sort of cultural problem in, or, in order to get more women uh, into the field and to change their impressions of themselves. So I've given a couple of talks, mostly back where I um, was a senior in high school in Pennsylvania, about projects that I did while um, I was at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. I worked on the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. And you can always make wonderful jokes and things like that um, about such a thing. And I also worked on um, processing a signal from balloons in the Venusian atmosphere. And the, Re uh, the Russians had these balloons up in the Venusian atmosphere. And we collected them at the United States antennas because they didn't have antennas big enough that could see Venus at the right time. And nobody, and the signals were also too noisy and they were very hard to deal with. And after months of work we managed to, to get the bits out, which unfortunately were mostly zero because it turned out the thermometer didn't turn on right. But anyway, after this hard work we got mostly zeros, but we did manage to do it. And I can give wonderful pictures of the balloon and the Venus atmosphere and little Venusians and things like this. So I try to, um, you know, besides doing my job, I sometimes try to encourage young girls not to lose sight of the fact that they can have exciting careers that they might think belong only to men. So um, I guess that's what I have to say.
one thing I'm sorry about is that we didn't get to see the pictures of the Venusians. <laughs> if I'd known, we could have put them up. Um, our last panelist is a current graduate student in the chemical engineering department. Her name is Cindy Simon, and she came to us from one of the institutions that gave women PhDs very, very early in this country. She comes from Yale. At Yale, Cindy was captain of the women's swim team. She was an All-American. She received many awards there, and she set 11 Yale varsity records. Unfortunately, we don't have a pool here, so we're going to ask her to talk instead of sleep. She currently um, is working on her dissertation. She has worked at Bell Labs. She's worked for the Beach Aircraft Corporation. And I think with no further ado, we'd like to hear about current experiences of women graduate students. Hi. Um, I guess the first thing I would say is about expectations. I had really high expectations about graduate school here, especially I think coming from Yale where um, they pride themselves on their liberalness and on their openness and their acceptance of women. And I don't know if it's just because I'm older that I see um, the sexism, even though it's subtle here, um, but I never saw it at Yale. And I don't know if it's because my consciousness was raised after working at Beach as a one out of three women engineers in in an uh, office full of 250 men engineers working on the same project, which was, you know, we'll, um, show you some sexism because I mean, a couple of those men did not think women should be there. But, um, and I don't know if that's what raised my consciousness or whether Princeton is a lot different than Yale, which is what I would hope to believe, but <laughs> I don't know if that's true. Um, I do think that the Princeton environment is much more hostile than it is nurturing to women here. And the, the discrimination and um, discouragement that we face is very subtle. And I think because it's so subtle that it's hard to pinpoint and it's very hard to deal with. Um, I think that there's a lack of communication among graduate women. And I think this is true among all graduate students. And this forces us to internalize our experiences and to feel that somehow we are inadequate or that we are to blame um, instead of recognizing that maybe it's the attitudes of the institution or the attitudes of the people who we are dealing with that are the problem. The, uh, I'll give you a few examples. I think the, the relationship with your thesis advisor is really critical to the experience that women have here. I love my, I'm not love, but I like my thesis advisor very much and we get along very well, but I still think that he treats me differently than he treats the male graduate students. For instance, if another student was going to a conference in New York City and the student had asked me if I was going to come because we're good friends and I said, sure. Well, he and Dr. Gillum were making plans to go to New York City and they were going to drive up together and they never you know, bothered to ask whether I wanted to go or how I was going to get there. And I had to talk to my women friends and say, should I go? Should I go? Maybe I'm not welcome. You know, and they kept encouraging me to just go and show up and listen to the talks because that would be good for my career and for my professional development. And I went and Dr. Gillen was very happy to see me, but he hadn't, had not thought to ask. This, this happened twice even, a couple months ago. There's a new first year graduate student in our office and he asked him if he wanted to go to the Gordon Research Conference, which is about the highest power, most powerful conference on polymers and it's in New Hampshire. And he had asked him, do you want to go this summer? And I have never been. And my other friend, he said, Cindy, you've got to go and tell Dr. Gillum that you want to go, that you want to present a poster, that you want to present your work. And I went and told him and he was delighted that I wanted to go. But he had never thought to ask. And if I hadn't been as assertive as I am, then I would have just assumed that I wasn't welcome or that my work wasn't good enough. And I think that it's a problem a lot of women face here, is that if they're, if they're not assertive or they don't have support, then they're left feeling like, like they're inadequate. 
um, I think that the whole environment at Princeton um, leads to this internalization of experiences in that there's, you know, every time I walk down Prospect Street and see an anti-feminist <coughs> slogan on the sidewalk or when I go to the Macintosh room at the Equad and the Macintosh computers can be named and they aren't named very nice things. They're named very anti-female things. I mean, really awful words. I mean, you can't even imagine how people would put these words on these computers and you print out your papers and up pops this little thing that says user and it has this name and you're like going, oh my god, you know. And, and people, you call up the computer center and complain and they say, well, they can't do anything. It's the students that are doing that. And it is um, the students who are doing it, but I think that the, it's not fashionable, fashionable to be overtly sexist here, but this covert sexism is nobody can do anything about it. And nobody talks about it really and tries to change people's attitudes. I guess that is why um, I think one of the reasons why the Graduate Women's Alliance was formed last summer. And the Graduate Women's Alliance is a group of graduate women who were formed in order to raise consciousness at the university about problems that graduate women face and also to provide a support system for graduate women so that we can talk to one another and meet one another and find out that these experiences that we're all having, you know, have a common thread so that we don't feel like it's only me that feels like I'm not invited to the conference, but that other people have similar experiences and, and in that way we can try to overcome these things. Um, I guess you know that I have a lot of a lot of <laughs> stories that I could tell, but I think that the only other thing I'd, I'd like to say, Lisa has said this a lot, is that the women who come here to graduate school are here because they want to be here and because they're smart enough and, and, and we're all very determined. And sometimes we feel like our professors um, don't expect very much out of us or that they expect that we should be somewhere else. Um, you know, like that you should be at home taking care of your kids. Well, Lisa has two kids, but she was the first woman in her department to get her degree. Yes, this decade. This decade. <laughs> I mean, out of her class. Her class, out of her class, right, I'm sorry. But, um, you know, they, people say things like you shouldn't have kids when you're in graduate school, and I think that's a problem with for a lot of women is, you know, like when do you want to have kids? Because when I graduate, I'm going to hopefully teach, and I'm going to try to get tenure, and it's not a good time to have children while I'm here, and it's not a good time while I'm getting tenure, and at that time I'm going to be 36 or something, and that's a little too old to start having children, I think. <laughs> I mean, um, so I think that, you know, is it, the attitudes are really subtle and I think they're really hard to change, but hopefully we're changing them. The one good thing that happened was I got very upset at the Equad because the women didn't have a shower. The men have, can use the shower by the machine shop because men are supposed to do the machining, although graduate women do their own machining too, so it's not a very good excuse. But I, I talked to the dean at the engineering school and he built me a shower on my floor, specifically for me, I think. But this way I can take showers after a machine and I can go running at lunch like the rest of the men do. Um, so sometimes they are very um, supportive, but I think they're scared. <laughs> but I guess the main thing that I want to say is, um, that I think that Princeton does have a long way to go and that, that I think that the attitudes, you know, are really entrenched and I think they're just as entrenched among the faculty and the administration as they are among the male graduate students and even the male undergraduates. It's a very conservative place and um, I guess we just have to keep trying. <laughs> Thanks. Well, 
I'd like to thank all the panels for their remarks. We have a few minutes left before lunch. I'd like to know if any of you have questions or things that you'd like to add to today's discussion. Yes. Well, the, the, um, we work with the Graduate Student Union, and we work pretty closely with them, and so a couple of their members do come once in a while when we're working, we work on projects together. So, um, and we go to their meetings. So, yes, graduate men have come to our meetings, and they're very welcome. They want to work. Great. <laughs> a lot of people want to work, but, but we do. But they do. We do try to work very closely with the student, graduate student unions, primarily male, because that's primarily who the graduate students are. I mean, two thirds of them. So. Anybody else? I think this is a hungry crowd. Um, <laughs> before before we leave, I'd like to do one thing. We, in addition to our our activities today. We have a special commemorative t-shirt. This is it, it says Princeton Celebrates Women. Now if there's a classicist in the room, you can see the new motto which is Femine Matriculate Sunt <laughs> underneath the shield. Uh, I'm going to present one of these shirts to each of our panelists today. And for those of you who'd like to celebrate with us, we do have them available, they'll be here at lunch. And if there's anyone who is interested in the Women Reflect About Princeton book that you've heard mentioned today, we'll have that available too. I'd like to thank our panelists. I'd like to thank all of you who've been a wonderful audience. Please join us for lunch. If you're not signed up, you can come. We have a special price for graduate students, $3. And for anyone else who has not registered for the reunion lunch, it would be 7 Thank you very much. Thank you.